If you've been following my work for a while, you know that I bring together insights from many different fields to help us understand how change happens in the world. And one of the major thrusts of the study that I've done over the last several years has been to bring insights from cognitive science together so that we could tackle issues in politics, economic development, social innovation, collaboration, organizational development, and several other fields. And I know many of you out there are grappling with how to bring this, this vast body of knowledge together in your own work. So what I want to do today is I want to share with you a broad set of books that I have read that have been very helpful to me in shaping my thinking and that I think could be helpful to you. So you could kind of think of this as like a, a crash course in uh, the applications of cognitive science to large-scale social change. So let's start out with some books more in the philosophical space. So first of all, I've got this one right here, Mindware, by Andy Clark. This is, uh, the subtitle is An Introduction to the Philosophy of Cognitive Science. And this book is a great overview of uh, the major philosophical battles and debates in the cognitive sciences throughout the last century. So it's kind of a must read for anyone who really wants to understand the landscape of, uh, of uh, science and of philosophy around uh, our understanding of human nature. Now another one that's more recent, this one here by Jerome Feldman, From Molecule to Metaphor, is uh, a book that explores how uh, the brain is able to construct uh, conceptual architecture to hold our thoughts. So this is a book that lays out how, um, how the workings of the brain are related to the functioning of language. It's really a, a, an incredible piece of work, um, but maybe a bit scholarly for you. Now this one here, George Lakoff's Women, Fire, and Dangerous Things, is uh, one of his most important books. You know, most people know Lakoff for his work in politics, but this book is actually, um, it does something pretty spectacular, but something that might sound a little academic. What he does is he describes how uh, what's been learned in neuroscience and in psychology uh, and in um, areas of perceptual research, like, say, the way that our visual system works, those kinds of fields, to help us understand human conceptualization. And just in case you're wondering, the title, Women, Fire, and Dangerous Things, is actually a category in an indigenous tribal culture, where uh, one category, like the category for blueness, there's a category that holds women, fire, and dangerous things. And this book explains how uh, categories work in the human mind. Now, um, you've probably heard uh, people talking about or seen in my writings that uh, there's a growing understanding that the way the mind works is grounded in the body. Well, this book by Joseph Ledoux, who's a, a neuroscientist, it's called The Synaptic Self, How Our Brains Become What We Are, explains how, uh, kind of in, in a lot of depth, uh, in a lot of detail, uh, the particular workings of the brain and how those workings of the brain lead to the processing of emotions and thoughts. So it's uh, quite an accomplishment as well in that it links our sense of identity and our ability to conceive of ourselves as cogent, whole, autonomous beings through the workings of our brains. In a similar brain, I actually, a similar vein, I want to share with you three books written by another neuroscientist named Antonio Damasio. So the first one, Descartes' Error, uh, is kind of a classic now in the cognitive sciences. It's published in the early 90s. And this book explains in uh, through a lot of case studies of people experiencing degenerative brain disease and head trauma, uh, it shows how, um, how reasoning requires the working of emotion. And it's uh, really a wonderful book and is widely cited. One that's less known, but I think is possibly even more significant, is the, the second book in his uh, series, The Feeling of What Happens. This book gives the first fully neurological account of how consciousness can arise in the workings of the brain. And so if you're interested in understanding how the mind can come from the way the brain works, this is a must-read now, it is a bit dense at times, and it deals with a lot of neuroscience, so you have to grapple with that. But uh, if you want to understand how consciousness works in a scientifically rigorous way, this is probably the best entry point you're going to find. And then he capped off his series, uh, Damasio did, with this book here, Looking for Spinoza, 
Joy, Sorrow, and the Feeling Brain. And this is much more of a philosophical book. So the great thing about Antonio is that he's uh, one of those very philosophically astute scientists. So he knows philosophy as well as he knows science. And what he does in this book is he goes back into uh, the era of later Enlightenment philosophy and looks at the work of Spinoza, who's a lesser known philosopher, and shows that Spinoza was basically right about the mind and human nature and the origins of morality. But his work was largely overlooked because neuroscience wasn't advanced enough. And it wasn't until the late 20th century that neuroscience came, was able to catch up with his thinking. Now, another philosopher um, who you may have heard of if you follow the work of George Lakoff, he's a collaborator of George's, is a guy named Mark Johnson. So here's a book, Moral Imagination, Implications of Cognitive Science for Ethics. You see, Mark Johnson, um, in this book, this is a, a really a, a fun read, um, and it's very insightful about how human creativity works and how we're able to blend concepts and create new understandings from uh, Founded, kind of grounded um, structures of thought, like uh, metaphors that map our bodily experience to the conceptual domain. And then he elaborates from those basic sorts of things to a full ex explanation of how we're able to imagine scenarios to test out the ethics of those situations. And he gives us the first account of um, body-based situational ethics. He came back about... Um, I don't know, what was it 15 years later, and did a follow-up book of the meaning of the body as the aesthetics of human understanding. And this book um, is just a real pleasure to read if you're interested in the implications of cognitive science for uh, the study of culture, the arts, music, ethics, uh, then this is your book. It's very readable. And um, like one of the things he does is he explains how music theory is related to the part of the brain that, um, that what's called the sensory motor cortex, that explains how our ability to simulate motion, like say a coordinated activity of the hand or the leg, uh, is actually activated and used in the experience of um, melody and tempo and music. So this is a really cool book to look at the relationship between the arts and science through a philosophy of embodied uh, cognitive science. Now, more generally, um, this uh, idea of embodiment is uh, something that's come about in many different fields. And I'm really pleased that uh, Raymond Gibbs, who's a cognitive psychologist, put together this book, Embodiment and Cognitive Science. Now, this is definitely more of a researcher's book than a layperson's book. Because what Ray does in this book is he uh, goes through and systematically gathers up all the peer-reviewed research of different, um, different experimental studies that show how embodiment works. So he, look, you know, he gathers up information uh, in um, robotics and artificial intelligence. He gathers information in um, physical therapy uh, where people will have, say, uh, their arm has been cut off because of a car accident and they're given a, a, a limb, like, you know, a prosthetic limb. And then he'll look at uh, how the brain has this kind of ghost limb effect. And there's a lot of different studies that show that. So he goes through and systematically gathers up all the research that validates embodiment uh, through, I don't know, 20, 25 different fields. It's more of a scholarly book, definitely for the researcher. But if you're interested in understanding how embodiment works and seeing the full evidence for it, this is a fantastic resource. Now, if you want to think more about embodiment at a philosophical level, this is another one of those founding texts. It's uh, widely cited now, The Embodied Mind, and it's by Francisco Varela, uh, Evan Thompson, and Eleanor Roche. So it's a neuroscientist, a philosopher, and a cognitive psychologist. And what they do in this book that's really beautiful is they critique uh, faulty philosophies of cognitive science through the lens of uh, Buddhist contemplative practice might sound like that's a non sequitur, like it doesn't really fit. But as it turns out, the um, introspective approach of presence, of being aware of how the mind is working in the body, that kind of mindfulness meditation, gives us insights into how we've developed a flawed notion of separation between mind and body, and uh, what are actually false notions of self. And so um, Buddhist contemplative practice has come upon insights that modern um, or contemporary uh, psychology and neuroscience are now validating. And this book is a great entry point into the philosophy of embodied mind, uh, and it's now widely cited for that purpose. 
Now, another one that, um, you know, I said that uh, there's George Lakoff, whom you know from uh, his work in politics. You may not know that he wrote a book with Rafael Nuno. It's called Where Mathematics Comes From. In this book, uh, it uh, it lays out how the the concepts used in mathematics are actually grounded in our physical, um, neurological, and psychological being. So the way that our brains process information and the way that we cultivate knowledge through our experience is also how we learn mathematics. And so this book offers the beginnings of a philosophy of mathematics to show that something that's seemingly so abstract is also grounded in the bodily experience. Of course, probably the most important work that George Lakoff has, has created, and he wrote it with Mark Johnson, is this book, Philosophy in the Flesh, The Embodied Mind and Its Challenge to Western Thought. Now, it took them seven years to write this book. And you can see it's thick, right? This is a big one. This is the tome. You could maybe even think of this as George Lakoff's magnum opus. This is his, uh, his primary or most important accomplishment. In this book, what George and Mark do is they systematically go through the major tenets of Western philosophy and recraft them based on what we now know about cognitive science. So they take 2,500 years of philosophy and they recast it with what we now know from science. This is a major accomplishment. This is one of those books that I think is going to have ripples across the scholarly community for decades. Uh, and it's still not widely read enough. I mean, in a few circles, it's well known. But for the most part, people haven't heard of this book. They're much more familiar with George's political works. Speaking of which, um, if I were to bring out George's works, his, his most popular one, of course, is this one, Don't Think of an Elephant. This is a collection of essays that apply cognitive science and specifically framing and metaphor to political discourse. Uh, you've probably heard of that one. Uh, what you may or may not know is that that book was actually inspired, or it's kind of a condensing of a much larger book, Moral Politics, How Liberals and Conservatives Think, which he originally published in 1996, and then a second edition came out in 2002. This is the book that explains how the nation as family metaphor maps systematically onto moral worldviews that are very different for, progress for liberals and for conservatives. So if you want to understand political thought, this book lays it out in, what is it, it's more than 500, it's 450 pages. So this is a very thorough exploration of uh, human conceptual thought and moral reasoning within the political domain. Now, George came out uh, later with another book, um, The Political Mind. This book um, does a lot more of a kind of overview and synthesis of how cognitive science maps onto pol uh, political thought and behavior. So if you're interested in political thought and behavior, this is a very important book. And um, uh, kind of a partner to it, written by another researcher, Drew Weston, is this book, The Political Brain. Now, see, uh, Drew Weston is a neuropsychologist. So he's a psychologist who studies the, um, the information processing in the brain. He's at Emory University. And in this book, he explains a lot of how brain function works and how it relates to uh, political decision making. So it's, a, it's pretty well known in political circles these days, but definitely a, a good one if you want to understand um, cognitive science as it's applied to politics. Now, George has written a couple of other books that you may also be familiar, familiar with. This one, Thinking Points, uh, which he wrote um, in partnership with the uh, intellectual staff at the Rockridge Institute. This is much more of a practitioner's book. So if you're interested in advocacy, political communications, engagement strategy, community organizing, this is a good book to read because it's definitely written um, with the practitioner in mind, not nearly as scholarly as some of these other books. Now, George also, um, kind of following that book I mentioned earlier, Women, Fire, and Dangerous Things, um, George um, created this book, or wrote this book, Whose Freedom? The Battle Over America's Most Important Idea. And this book looks at um, how the conceptual structure or the category structure for freedom works. Now, that might seem like it's an intellectual or a kind of academic endeavor, but it turns out that um, freedom is a fundamentally contested concept which means that the context you bring to it and the values you bring to it shape what it means to you. What George does in this book is he um, rigorously and comprehensively deconstructs the category of freedom to show how different political worldviews shape how it's understood. So that's, a, that's an important one for, politi for political thinking. 
Now this book here, what Orwell didn't know, this is actually a collection of writings, and you can see Propaganda and the New Face of American Politics. So this book was written on the anniversary, it was the 50th anniversary of the publication of, a book, of an essay that Orwell wrote about politics in the English language. And uh, the editors of the book uh, went out and asked a, set, a, a large number of thinkers uh, to reflect on what Orwell got right and what we've learned since then. So this is another one of those practical books for political communication. Uh, so now, um, moving a little bit into another space. You're probably familiar with uh, George Lakoff's work on framing. What you may not know is that uh, framing actually has been developed in several different fields. And one of the other foundational thinkers of framing is this guy, Irving Goffman. So Goffman wrote this book, Frame Analysis, in the mid-70s. And uh, he's a sociologist. So he wrote this book from the perspective of how do we understand social context and what are the roles and relationships in those social contexts and how do they set our expectations. So if you want to understand um, more about framing, then this is a really good book for you to read to get a deeper understanding of um, where it comes from and how it applies to social process. A more recent book in framing is this one, Framing Public Life. So it's edited by uh, Stephen Reese, Oscar Gandy, and August Grant. And this book is much more about uh, media and communications. So this is a collection of essays that look at how frame analysis is done in media and discourse. So if you want to do frame analysis and discourse, this is a very good book to have. Now in other domains um, where we could think about cognitive science, you know, there's as you're seeing already, there's a lot here. But um, like, let's take... Uh, Let's, let's look at um, religion and morality. So there's this great book, The Spell of the Sensuous by David Abram. Uh, this is more of a philosophical book, but what he does in this book is he explores um, how our moral sensibility in the modern world has become uh, separated from nature. And he's a, a cognitive psychologist as well as cultural anthropologist. So he studies indigenous tribal cultures to show how um, the, the evolution of language in different cultures uh, led to a place where um, we uh, ended up having what are called written phonetic languages. And those languages uh, have um, characters that represent sounds in the mouth rather than things that are in nature. And that created an abstraction or a separation of mind and thought from nature. So this book gives us a sense of the origins of mind-body dualism, how it comes about through a way of structuring language, and how that plays out in morality uh, and our sensibilities about the natural world. Now another one, um, another one of those kind of key books, if you're interested in the applications of cognitive science to religion, is this one, Religion Explained by Pascal Boyer. You see the title, the subtitle is The Evolutionary Origins of Religious Thought. So Pascal Boyer um, brings cognitive science and ethnographic field research from anthropology. He brings them together and explains how religious concepts get transferred from one generation to the next. So if you're interested in how religion works um, anthropologically, this is a great book for you. Um, a kind of a partner to that one is this other book. This is more of an academic book, Modes of Religiosity by Harvey Whitehouse. And um, this book, uh, see, he calls it a cognitive theory of religious transmission. So this is more of a, a technical dive into Pascal Boyer's theory of how concepts are conveyed across um, generations. So you could think, if you're familiar with meme theory, how a meme is spread across society. This book looks at the cognitive psychology of that. And so that's another one if you're interested in religious thought and cognitive science. Now, there are two books here. Um, one of them is um, The Moral Mind by Mark Hauser. The other one is The Moral Animal um, by Robert Wright. These are both more um, what would be called evolutionary psychology books. And actually, when I read them, I found there were a couple of problems with them philosophically that you could address in that large pile of books I shared with you on, um, on philosophy. But they're still really good at helping you understand um, how evolutionary biology can inform the way we understand um, human nature and morality. In that same vein, um, here's one of those books that has more of a light title, but is actually very, very insightful, is Why Sex is Fun, The Evolution of Human Sexuality by Jared Diamond. 
You might know of Jared Diamond because of his book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, or the other one he wrote, Collapse. Uh, this book, which is a lot shorter, um, looks at how we can understand um, human sexuality by looking at the history of hominids, meaning uh, looking at primates. How are we similar to or different from bonobos? How are we similar to or different from gorillas? Uh, and really bringing a strong evolutionary biology perspective to sexuality and, and morality. It's a fun read, but it's also very, very insightful. Now, um, while we're talking about um, evolution, here are two books for you that um, give a much deeper context to how human nature works. So here's one, On Deep History in the Brain by Daniel Lord Smale. This book is actually written um, with the goal of changing the way that people study history. But it's really a wonderful book in uh, that it shows if we want to understand um, human history in our deep origins, which means how do we arise from evolution? Um, how did we come into being with uh, the changing planet and that deep historic sensibility? Then we have to understand how the brain evolved. We have to understand how um, the, the core kind of um, hind brain or the brainstem part of our uh, brain is related to um, reptiles, for example, and how the evolution of reptiles shaped the way that they behave. That also partly shapes how we behave. So this book is really good at giving you a sense of what deep history is and how to apply evolutionary biology, especially with respect to the changing brain over time, to understand our deep origins. Now, another book, um, this one's highly technical, very dense. This is not for the light of heart, but it's a fantastic book. It is Incomplete Nature uh, by Terence Deacon. Now, what Terry does in this book is um, he takes his expertise, which is he's an anthropologist, and he studies um, the evolutionary development of the human brain and how it came into being. And so what he does in this book that's just phenomenal is he um, very rigorously shows how uh, dynamic patterns can form to create goal-directed behavior. So we know that all biological organisms are goal-directed. They try to survive, and they try to reproduce. Uh, and humans have this really amazing ability um, to consciously set goals for ourselves and be purposeful. And so in this book, he uh, explains how those dynamic patterns emerge. So this is a book that looks a lot at complexity and um, how uh, complexity emerges in natural systems to explain how the mind can emerge in a natural system that is the human organism as it evolves. So it's, it's a very good book, but like I said, not for the faint of heart. It's definitely more of a scholarly work. Now in a similar vein of applying complexity to uh, human nature and the mind, here's one that's uh, really a lovely book, Out of Control by Kevin Kelly. You see, The New Biology of Machines, Social Systems, and the Economic World. Kevin Kelly is the executive editor of Wired Magazine. Uh, this was one of the um, major inspirations for the Matrix movies in the 90s. And what Kevin Kelly does in this book is he uh, challenges the notion that machine intelligence, artificial intelligence, will be different from human intelligence by saying that uh, the way that we will develop artificial intelligence is through biomimicry. As we better understand how biological systems work, like say, the way that an ant navigates through a space, then we improve robotics, we improve machine learning. And what we end up with is this place where you can no longer separate machine from biological organism. An example of this in today's context would be Twitter. Twitter is a technology, it's a machine, like a robot, but it works by connecting lots of humans into a large collective intelligence. And the, uh, the processing of Twitter requires human activity as much as the machine piece of it. And really, you can't separate the functionality of Twitter into human and machine. They're completely blended. So that kind of philosophical thinking was developed by Kevin Kelly in this book. And it's, it's a really good read um, for understanding, kind of delving into how complexity and biomimicry shape our understandings of the mind. Now getting into uh, a little bit different space, let's uh, talk for a moment about how cognitive science can be applied to um, marketing, to communications, uh, to organizing people, and to designing better human systems all these great applications. So here's a cool book um, by Seth Godin, Unleashing the Idea Virus. In this book, he explains a lot of how cognitive psychology can inform the way that we design ideas so that they can spread more easily. 
So you think about the Occupy movement last year and how readily the Occupy frame and the 99% frame uh, spread all around the world. They spread like a virus. And so they um, could be understood in the way that Seth Godin describes in this book. If you want to understand how ideas spread um, to self-organize and propagate themselves, this is a great book to read. Similarly is uh, this book right here, Made to Stick by Chip Heath and Dan Heath, Why Some Ideas Survive and Others Die. This is a book for um, people who are in marketing, who want to develop products, and who want to communicate ideas that spread really rapidly. So what they do is they combine understandings of best practices in teaching, and uh, also interesting insights into urban legends and folklore to show how rumors and ideas spread and how teachers can get ideas to stick in the minds of uh, students. And they apply their insights into those two domains to help us understand how to design ideas so that they are more sticky in people's minds. Uh, similarly, um, here's another book in that same vein, uh, Making Meaning. Uh, how Successful Business Delivers Meaningful Customer Experiences. This book looks at how to design experience so that experience is meaningful, satisfying, and purposeful for people. And it's uh, an exploration of how the business world is being redefined around uh, focus on meaning and experience. And so if you want to design the experience for people and understand how to do that better, this is a great book to read. Here's another one that I'm actually I'm a bit disturbed by in some ways, but at the same time, it's very useful. The Buying Brain um, by A.K. Pradeep. Now, this book um, teaches people how to use the best insights coming out of uh, brain science to market products to people better. So you can see why I, I find that to be a little ethically uncomfortable. But at the same time, it's very, very insightful if you are a designer. So if you design communications, if you design engagement strategy, this book will give you lots of practical insights. Here's another one um, that was written by a person who does media studies, Stephen Duncombe. Um, so Dream, Reimagining Progressive Politics in an Age of Fantasy. This book explores how to use media and pop culture to engage the masses more effectively. Very cool book. All right, and another one, um, this is a little different. Um, the Logic of Failure by Dietrich Dorner. So he's, Dietrich Dorner is a cognitive psychologist. And what he does in this book is he explains how people fail to understand um, the complexity of systems they're embedded in and make gross errors that lead to catastrophic failure. So if you're into the design of sustainability and helping people transition to a sustainable world, this book will help you understand how it is that people can misunderstand the systems that they're in and make gross errors. So they might presume that the global economy can just grow forever and not understand the system. So those kinds of gross errors um, are explained very well with lots of practical insights in this book. All right, so we're, we're getting close here. You can see uh, we're moving along. We've covered a lot of ground. But uh, let me just share a few more with you. So here's another set of books um, that get more into um, how to understand the mind in a broad way to uh, really incorporate lots of insights into whatever it is you're trying to do, including living a happy and fulfilling life. So here's a great book by Jonathan Haidt, The Happiness Hypothesis. So John Haidt is a social psychologist who focuses on human morality. And what he does in this book that's just lovely is he takes all of the psychological research that's, that was out there at the time of writing and explains how happiness works and how psychological resilience works. And he does it through the lens of looking at ancient approaches to wisdom through prophets and mystics and great philosophers and shows how they were right and how they were wrong based on what we now know from contemporary psychology. Very useful book for understanding yourself, your life, your relationships, as well as system design for culture and society. All right, so um, a couple other ones that are maybe a little more abstract. So there's another one by Ray Gibbs. You know, he wrote that embodied, uh, embodiment and cognitive science book, Intentions and the Experience of Meaning. This book explains how human communication works. So if you want to understand the difference between your intention and communication and how the context shapes what it's going to mean to someone, it's kind of a technical academic book, but it really delves into that in a profound way. Here's another one of those books that you've probably not heard of, but is incredibly important in cognitive science. The Way We Think 
Conceptual Blending in the Mind's Hidden Complexities by Guy Fauconnier and Mark Turner. This book explains how human creativity works in a profound way. They have this concept of conceptual blending, which is basically the ability of, of our brain to take disparate information and form new gestalts, form new cogent wholes, new completenesses, new concepts. This book shows us how new concepts arrive in, or arise in the brain. It's one of those foundational works that is going to have huge repercussions. I see if not this book, at least their body of work, as having ripple effects across many different disciplines over the next few de decades. And funny thing is, is, it's largely unknown today. So if you want to jump ahead and make major breakthroughs, read this book, and, um, and you'll learn a lot about how human creativity works. So here's another one. This is uh, The Construction of Meaning, uh, er edited by uh, Sarah Lichtenstein and Paul Slovic. This, I'm sorry, The Construction of Preference. This book um, is in the realm of decision research, and it's, uh, we can see it's a large book. It's a collection of essays that explain how human decision making works. So you can see this one full of lots of important insights for a lot of different applications. And now, um, just to wrap us up, I've got this final set of books. Um, these are a combination of books that look at um, how we apply cognitive science to society at large, and also how we see how some misguided notions of human nature have come into being and have kind of gotten stuck there. So this is a philosophical book, Modern Social Imaginaries by, Social, uh, or by Charles Taylor. What he does in this book that's really nice is he explains how mythic narratives like the Horatio Alger story of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps can become what he calls a social imaginary, which is a story that people imagine into being, meaning they, they live it as though it's real, and it changes the culture to change the society they're in so that it becomes real. If enough people believe in pulling yourself up by their, your bootstraps, you end up with a more individualistic society. And so he explains how that works, so that cultural dynamic. <clears throat> All right, here's another one that's kind of an oldie but goodie. Uh, Walter Lippmann wrote this book, Public Opinion. This book, not a really boring title, but it's fantastic under, a way to understand how propaganda works. So Walter Lippmann did a lot of um, uh, wartime propaganda during World War I and then also World War II, and um, he was a foundational thinker in creating the field of public relations. And this book explains how, um, basically how the media manipulates the masses. And so if you want to understand how that works, to use it for good or ill, this book is out there and it's widely read. And it's a, it's a very important one to kind of have a foundational understanding of where public relations and propaganda come from. Here's another one, um, Rationalizing Capitalist Democracy. See, it's by S.M. Amade. This book explains uh, where the theory of rational action comes from. So if you've heard of rational choice theory or this notion that economics should be based on maximizing self-interest, this book explains uh, how a small set of think tanks, actually one in particular, the Rand Corporation, but also a network around them, developed um, this theory of, of decision making in a context that uh, was never actually tested. And then when later uh, psychologists and behavioral scientists started studying it, they showed that it was wrong. So here's a book that explains the political agenda and the institutional framework and the, the organizations that benefited from that agenda to bring the theory of rational action to the fore and make it the dominant economic paradigm for the global economy. This book explains how that works. Here's another one, um, if you want to understand broad cultural trends, The Cultural Creatives. Um, this book looks at broad sociological trends to show how uh, human, human civilization, um, especially in the developed countries, because they look primarily at the U.S. and Western Europe, although there's some in other uh, countries as well, to show how there's an emerging new way of being where people are much more grounded in a sense of meaning and purpose, relationship to nature, relationship to community, and how that's transforming the world. So this book will help you understand the global social movements that are just exploding on the scene right now. Probably an even better book, and the one that I'm going to finish with today, is this one, The Empathic Civilization, The Race to Global Consciousness in a World in Crisis by Jeremy Rifkin. So this book beautifully describes how Modern understandings of cognitive science are shaping the way that we understand the history of civilization. 
specifically, though, what Rifkin uh, explores in this book is how as societies become more sophisticated with time, they become more complex as they grow, how they increase the capacity for empathy for the people in those societies. And so he lays out for us a, a choice point, a place where we can go one way or the other, where either we lead ourselves to global economic and civilization collapse and basically destroy ourselves, or we develop a capacity for empathy embedded in our civilization that allows us to save ourselves and move to a new level of cultural evolution. And this book is just fantastic. His mastery of economics, of history, of science, of technology, and how innovation works, just phenomenal. So this book explores all of that. So it's kind of like a culminating point if you want to bring a lot of understandings of cognitive science together in a very relevant discussion of what's happening in the world right now. This is a great book. So, you know, I just gave you this whirlwind. I, I really threw all this at you because, you know, anyone watching this video might pick two or three of these books and find them very useful. But I found that in the way that I've approached my understanding of cognitive science, that I haven't been grounded in a particular discipline. I haven't been a psychologist or a linguist, uh, you know, or some specific field. And you can see from the sampling of books I shared here that uh, there's this convergence of understanding across many different fields of research. And for the first time ever, we really are grappling with a legitimate understanding of human nature and the mind. And now the question is, what do we do with it? Now, my focus, the thing that I'm most interested in, is helping to design the transition process. How do human beings create the change in the world to move us toward a sustainable and just global civilization? And there are lots of ways that that can work. And you can see that in this set of books, you can get a sense of my own personal journey. You know, this is a large sampling of the books that I've read in cognitive science. Uh, probably about half of the ones that I've read. And um, you can see how it's informed my thinking by just what's already here. Now, what I'm really excited about is to see what you do with it. So take this, run with it. Contact me if you have any questions about any of these books or if you want to explore these ideas further. Um, I'm a huge proponent of open access to information and the democratization of ideas. So I'm just sharing this with you because I want as many people as possible to know this stuff. But of course, if I can be of service in helping you understand it better, please, please let me know. And in the meantime, uh, I wish you a happy and fruitful journey in your own intellectual development, and that I uh, hope this helps to empower you to be a better change maker in the world. So um, go forth and multiply. <laughs>